Hey guys, welcome back to RHR Jen. I'm so glad you're here. I had a lot of requests to revisit Revenge, one of my favorite books I've covered. I loved covering this book. I love everything that Tom Bauer had to say in it. And so yeah, so as per your request, I thought we could revisit one of my favorite like cringe awfulness from the time that they were, there's so much to choose from, but one of the, one of the awful cringe moments of their time with the Royal family. So I thought we could take a look at that again. Thank you for being here and for supporting, you know, it means a whole wide world to me. Now let's take a look at revenge, jump into revenge. So we pick back up, we finish up with chapter 33 farewell. So this episode, I'm going to get into chapter 34. There really wasn't too much to chapter 34, but then we get into chapter 35, the trial. That's the one where Megan is fighting with the mail on Sunday. Remember for breach of privacy in regards to the letter to her father, which she sure didn't mind leaking in the People Magazine article, but she didn't want that whole thing out there. She didn't want people to realize what a villain she was, so she was fighting. So we'll get into that. We'll get into her lapdog. <laughs> we'll get into her lapdog, Omid Scobie. That guy's popping up more in this episode. Lots to talk about. All right. So we pick up with Harry saying about Megan, she saved me. Saved you from what? <laughs> Being nice to your family? Yep, she sure saved you from that. So March 2020 happens, and it's their last trip to London before, I don't know, the victimhood swallowed them whole. So they had a dramatic finale. Remember the pictures with the umbrella and the blue dress, and they're like looking at each other like, we did it. We survived. Survived what? My God, you two. So March rolls around, and Harry's told that he and Megan couldn't join the family on the balcony for the Commonwealth service. Well, while they're happy to walk away from any duties, they were not happy to walk away from the privilege of standing up there waving to, well, I guess riding the heels of people like the Queen and um, Catherine and William's adoring fans. <laughs> but... They were not happy about that. So Harry was told that for this Commonwealth service, he and Megan would sit with the congregation. Well, the isolation appearing in public humiliated them. These were Tom Bauer's words. So I find that hilarious. I hope it did and enjoy that. I mean, the fact that they're even allowed there is more generous than I would have been is, you know. Okay, so Harry looks strained. Megan face showed bemusement. Bauer is pointing out that even on her last day, Megan couldn't understand why her demands were not being met. Again, just the idea that the family works together. It's not all about Megan. Couldn't wrap her head around that. She ended up flying to Vancouver from Heathrow. Is this the flight, I believe, where she claims that that man got down and said, thank you. Thank you for your service. Like she did something honorable or something I don't know oh god you guys it's just so thick with bullshit so thick Bauer goes into how the palace did absolutely everything to welcome her from arranging adventures to you know funding her wedding her house her staff giving her the foreign tours and very limited duties anything that they could to make her feel more comfortable and yet she loves to sing that tune, how nobody helped her, even though it turns out she had a team of, I believe it was 15. I think it was um, the lead person and then 14 under her. So, you know, she was given nothing, you guys, a team of 15, a house, tens of millions of dollar wedding, <laughs> but she was given nothing. Poor survivor, right? Wow. I just don't even know how you spin that story in your own mind. I mean, I know she's a narcissist. She doesn't think like normal people, but I just, I can't wrap my head around that. If somebody gives me like a $20 gift, I'm writing them a thank you, right? Like, <laughs> it's just crazy, crazy. So Bauer points out at this point, the nation was kind of divided on Harry and Meghan. You know, people seem to be okay with them leaving if they wanted to leave, but they didn't need to go out like this. And they were perplexed by Megan's lament. I gave up 
my entire life for this family. Uh, you'd only been there, what, like three years? I think it was three years in Britain. So what exactly did you give up? We already knew she was being written out of suits, allegedly, and that nothing else was popping up. Bauer went into that. So what? what is it that you're giving up? Okay, during this time, the Sussexes were still setting up California stuff. They were setting up the Archwell, whatever. I'm going to use the word foundation, but I don't... <laughs> There's been newer developments into that. Don't believe it's a foundation. They were trying to launch themselves as, quote, global influencers. Archwell at this point was described as a nonprofit. And I'm laughing because, again, deep dive, or just Google, Google Archwell nonprofit and see what pops up because you'll find out there's lots of um, stuff going on there. So, so. Supposedly, they didn't have any money in that fund yet, and no clear wording of how private funds would be divided versus the nonprofit side of things. But you know what? Don't let logistics bog you down. <laughs> Just make it up as you go along. That seems to be Harry and Meghan's thing, right? So March 2020, Harry and Meghan took a private flight between Vancouver and Los Angeles, and they ended up in an $18 million dollar Beverly Ridge compound. Megan returned to California after nine years of being gone. So because of the global crisis going on, Harry and Meg thought it'd be a good idea to put out a statement about how they're thinking of people and uh, just still turn it around on themselves and a lot of self-pity and lack of self-awareness there. Meanwhile, the queen gave a stirring and very genuine speech about we'll meet again. Um, versus Harry and Meghan's vapid self-centeredness. The public was starting to classify these two as self-pitying celebrities, and I love that so much. Okay, we get into Chapter 34, Paradise. So May 2020, they ended up in a nine-bedroom, 18,000-square-foot Montecito mansion. 14.65 million, eight acres. It included a gym, spa, cinema, and five-car garage. Who are their neighbors, you ask? Well, I'm glad you ask. Ellen, hey, that's weird, right? Because Megan and Ellen did something together. Oprah, hey, that's weird because we know about the ties between Oprah and these two. Gail King, again, weird, right? Because we know about the ties between Megan and Harry, Oprah and Gail. Head of Netflix was nearby. Gwyneth Paltrow, Katy Perry, David Foster. They seem to like to scratch each other's backs there, huh? All right, so they're getting embedded in Hollywood. Ugh, even that sentence makes me want to barf. Harry gave speeches about unconscious bias. Again, where have we heard this, right? This has come up quite a bit. It was during this time that Harry attacked the Commonwealth as colonial and, quote, racist. But just weeks earlier, he spoke to the Commonwealth and gave unquestioning praise. And talked about his grandmother's work. So interesting how in a few short weeks that changed. Omid Scobie, yep, I hate talking about him too. But he started to speak out against the Commonwealth. Interesting how that was working, right? It's almost like Megan had a hand in that. <gasps> what? They were becoming more loud and more obnoxious. And as they did, the public favor of these two was decreasing. They had it made people have decreased positive feelings. And Tom Bauer points out that at this point, they were still popular in America. I would like to point out I am in America and I disagree because I, for me, it was the South Africa thing when they were, when she gave that interview, nobody's asked me about me while standing in South Africa, <laughs> you know, where people have real problems and stuff. And yet she's saying nobody asked her about her. That's where I was like, yeah, I'm done with these two. All right, so let's get into chapter 35, the trial. So Harry's got ongoing mental health stuff, right? I'm not going to make fun of him for that. I get it. It sucks. What I am going to talk about is that he loves to use this and blame the media for it. He blames the media campaign and he goes against the tabloids. So again, nothing's ever their fault. So of course, why not blame the media? It couldn't be that you have your own mental struggles going on. They, at this point, launched their claim for breach of privacy made against the mail on Sunday. They call that dishonesty and malicious intent. And if you're just joining, we've been talking about this case a little bit in some of the episodes. 
but it's where they got a hold of the, the letter that was sent to her dad. The one that she clearly wanted out, but then could claim victimhood when it did get out. So she's claiming breach of privacy and malicious intent, even though she wrote the letter. <laughs> I mean, again, wade through the bullshit there, right? Thomas points out that by Megan suing the mail on Sunday, that's her way of showing she just wouldn't believe the media's portrayal of herself. She, during this time, was repeatedly advocating compassion. It was even talked about on Archwell. I believe they said it was the website it was talked about, that part of the whatever bullshit platitude statement was, one act of compassion at a time. And yet that is not something that she is willing to... She's she's not practicing what she's preaching, right? In terms of her dad, especially. But, well, it seems to be a theme because, yeah, that just seems to be ongoing with those two. Jeremy Clarkson comes to mind. So they were going to high court trial on privacy. And Tom Bauer explains that, I guess, in the UK, it's a little different. You do these pre-trial meetings to determine what's going to be allowed and what's not. And it kind of sets the stage for the trial going forward. So the male side was arguing during this time that there was no expectation of privacy, that the letter was written with the expectation that it might be leaked. Hello, she signed it, Meghan Markle. She wrote it in that ridiculous font. She knew what she was doing. She knew it would be leaked. She started it with daddy. Of course she knew it was going to be leaked. Oh, the other point that they made is Thomas had a right to speak out against the claims that he hadn't been trying to contact her. And then the third point that they made is Megan leaked part of the letter herself in that People magazine article. Okay, so remember how I was just saying in the UK, apparently, I guess trials are just done a little bit differently. So in this first part of the trial, a judge ordered Megan to pay 67,888 pounds which ended up being the cost for that hearing in full. He dismissed part of her claims as irrelevant. Megan had claimed that the Mail on Sunday acted, quote, dishonestly by leaving out passages of the letter, and he struck that part down. So as this was part of the pre-trial of it all, again, I'm trying to make sense of the UK stuff versus the things I know about American court, the way I'm understanding it is part of the pretrial. It was during this time Megan changed up her strategy. She ended up replacing some of her counsel and she took on this thing where she was vocally criticizing the palace advisors and blaming Knopf for not, I don't know, speaking out more on her behalf. It's ridiculous. It's also during this time that the Finding Freedom stuff was coming up. Omid Scobie was saying that there were no tears from anyone before the wedding. So apparently at that point, Megan had forgotten her story or changed it once again. Would later become where she said, no, Kate made me cry instead of what we already found out, which is she made Catherine cry. All right, so media criticism was totally unacceptable to Harry and Meghan, but they sure didn't mind assisting Scobie in criticizing the royal family, going to the media to criticize others, but it was not acceptable when it was aimed at them. Well, then Meghan once again changed her truth. She started saying that she and Harry did not collaborate with Scobie. They were not interviewed for it, even though we already know that Knopf had passed on the 20 whatever it was questions from Scobie. She decided at this point, oh, no, 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 we didn't help, even though clearly she had. She described allegations that she had helped work on this Finding Freedom, freedom with Scobie as false, fantastical, and a, quote, conspiracy theory. She denied being able to make changes on finding freedom and being able to fact check it. Okay, we already know what a control freak Megan was. There is no way if her lap dog was writing this book that she wouldn't have her grubby paws all in it. We already know this. Megan's truth was supported by Omid Scobie. Imagine that, huh? You mean her best friend is supporting whatever version of truth she's spinning at that moment? I'm shocked. So September rolls around and Omid signs a statement saying he didn't have any help from the Duke and Duchess. Okay. He signed a misleading statement to help them 
in their trial against the male on Sunday. Huh. That's interesting. You mean he lied to help his friends? What? So her lawyers were claiming that the letter was, quote, private, personal, and sensitive. The male argued, well, she anticipated being leaked. The male argued that she anticipated it being leaked and breached her own privacy by letting her friends speak up to People Magazine on her behalf. There were 49 examples listed as evidence that she indeed did work with Omid Scobie. Shocker. Details so precise were given in this book, like who said I love you first and things like that, that it could have only come from the Sussexes. She would later assert that she, quote, forgot her conversations, her emails, and her two-page memo to Knopf. That's interesting that they can forget things like that and yet remember every grievance ever in the book spare. Hmm. Weird how that works, right? If it benefits them, you know? So basically, if she were to admit that she'd worked with Scoby, her case would then go on to trial. That would not be good. She was pushing for a summary judgment because she didn't want to be subjected to cross-examination. So she was cooperating with Scoby's flattering account of her in finding freedom and totally okay with excerpts of her letter being quoted in the book. And yet she objected to the Mail on Sunday publishing the letter because they hate the media when it doesn't suit them exactly. Okay, so you ready for this? Seven weeks later, she changes her statement again. She's like, oh yeah, that's right. I did allow a friend talk to Scobie just to set the record straight, not for my own benefit. I'm not lying, you guys. I mean, I'm just aghast at this woman. It it just so much reminds me of Amber Heard. I cannot help but bring that up. That's all I can think about is the way that the lies change. And it's just so crazy because it's all verifiable stuff. But no, it doesn't matter if it suits her. She's going to spin a tale about it. But the victimhood mentality continues to rear its head because she claims she only did this to make sure that people knew that she didn't abandon her father, which is exactly what she did. And instead of just dealing with it and talking to her father about it, she'd rather go to all these lengths and continue this victimhood mentality and narrative. It was at this point she tried to hide behind the communications team of the palace and say, I don't know what what extent that they were helping Omid with this book, forgetting that she had written a two-page memo to Knopf detailing exactly what she wanted to say in the book and in this meeting with Omid. An interesting thing that came out in this part of the book is that she finally admits that the letter was not an in- the letter's intent was not reconciliation. But isn't that different than the story we heard earlier that she had acted like that's exactly why she was writing him. And that's why she didn't want the entire letter published because people would be able to see, oh, hey, she's just being a mega bitch again. She can't she can't keep her story straight and neither could Omid because Omid in the book, apparently, I haven't read the book. I keep I kicked out the idea of reading it maybe together. I don't know if I can stomach it, you guys. If we did, it'd just have to be like one video because I can't handle that guy. But he apparently in the book, according to Bauer, claims that he did speak to Megan, but then signed a statement in court saying, oh, no, he didn't speak to her. So apparently none of them can keep their story straight. So according to Bauer, after all this came out, Megan was again ordered to pay lawyers fees totaling 178,000 pounds. This is the part, again, where American courts, I guess, are just a little different. I, I hadn't heard of this, where you do it in stages like that, and I find it so fascinating. I don't I don't remember this part of the book, so it's interesting to reread it and to know these details. The chapter wraps up by saying, while all this was going on, Megan was just enjoying the sunshine out in California and laying the groundwork For her big appearance, dun dun dun, Oprah, and trying to brand Megan as an influencer. And I'm laughing because, again, she's been in hiding since since everything's gone down in real time. And I find that very fascinating. Anyway, so then we get into chapter 36, The Jigsaw. And all I can think of is the movie Saw. Uh, I feel like I'm being tortured having to read, having read Spare (laughs) and keeping up with these two. Ugh. 
It's a lot. But anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it here and we will get into chapter 36 next time. Thank you guys so much for being here. I hope it wasn't too confusing. I had to take so many notes to try to keep this stuff straight because it's all it's all foreign to me and trying to learn this stuff as I go I tried to keep all the details straight hopefully I did hopefully it made sense um, but anyway it's just fascinating to hear fascinating to learn and I'm still enjoying the heck out of this book so